All right, welcome back to the beautiful Pacific Northwest, land of plaid and coffee and pack West Bigfoot. This is David, and real quick, I just want to say um, this first and foremost, happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. You know what I have to say, um, <clears throat> well, this has been kind of a <laughs> unprecedented year, um, I do want to say that uh, it has been a blessing uh, to get your comments and your feedback and uh, actually um, just to to be here in this this community here with you of PacWest Bigfoot and just all things Bigfoot it's just so much fun and um, I just want to say thank you guys so very much thank you so very much and once again happy Thanksgiving to you and your family have a fun and safe Thanksgiving um, and, uh, with that, I do want to have, uh, do want to have, I do want to give a couple uh, shout outs here real quick to, uh, good friend Gunner and them over at, uh, <clears throat> Sasquatch Coffee Company. And, uh, of course, Mike out there at Bigfoot's Wilderness. Um, also, I promise I'd be giving some shout outs to some of the folks out there in the Bigfoot, uh, research community and just wanted to, um, you know, uh, one of them is, uh, James o. Rosenwig Sr. Uh, just wanted to say thank you so very much for your research and, uh, Andy, Chastine, um, thank you so very much for uh, your efforts out there in the Bigfoot research world. While some of us out here bring you the entertainment and things like that uh, to fill those nights um, and days with some cool <laughs> encounter stories, you guys are out there doing the work and uh, laying the foundation to um, just just awesome research uh, within this this whole topic. <clears throat> of Bigfoot and so I want to say thank you so very much and also I want to give a shout out and this is not these are not paid advertisements by any way any means so there you go uh ran across a gentleman named uh Jim Haggart he has Jim Haggart ca carvings you can find on Instagram I'm gonna tell you what if you guys are looking for like really cool um eclectic awesome artisan um woodwork for Chris for a Christmas present I'm telling you what I am <laughs> I am uh, in utter awe of uh, Jim's Jim's work. It is just absolutely amazing. So there you go. And uh, Jim Haggart, H A G G A R T carvings. Jim Haggart carvings. You can also probably Google it. And I think he has a website out there, or he's over on uh, one of those awesome little uh, ecom platforms online. You can find his stuff, but I do suggest you look him up on Instagram and check it out. So with that, let's get on with this week's PacWest Bigfoot Encounter Story. And if I take a few extra sips of uh, coffee this uh, uh, during this one, just to let you guys know, I actually have, uh, I have to go get a tooth extracted. I'm not kidding. I'm actually in pain. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so, but we will get through this because I really wanted to uh, share this uh, encounter story with you right here at Thanksgiving. So with that, let's get going. Please forgive me along the way. One more sip of that often, uh, often, often, awesome, <laughs> always awesome Sasquatch coffee. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Coastal bull elk hunt turns into Bigfoot nightmare. Ever wonder how you made it out of a situation alive you knew it had to be a miracle? Well, that is what happened to me when I found myself staring down a Bigfoot, a real live, massive, and ready to tear me apart Bigfoot. I'm not sure what happened in those last seconds, but there we were, in a staring contest, a contest I had to win, or, well, I was never to be found, that I was sure of second season elk hunt. The previous year before all of this, I got a, a 27 caliber uh, hunting rifle for my kids, a 270 caliber hunting rifle for my kids and wife for Christmas. And almost a year to the day, I was out using it on second hunt, the second elk hunt season along the Oregon coast. Hunting is a hobby and a passion of mine. Today, I still hunt in the same area where this occurred too. Call me crazy, but I love hunting. That particular hunting season, I enjoyed hap uh, I enjoy happens twice a year. And personally, my favorite place is the Oregon coast for elk hunting. My favorite is that last part of November each year, the second hunt, in fact. In November, the second elk hunt puts the pressure on me, and I like it a little I like a little competitiveness mixed in with the sport. 
there is nothing like a little pressure. And to make it even more competitive, a couple of my best friends head out with me and we have ourselves a little wager. Basically, whoever gets the first elk during that second hunt gets the first stake taken from the other guy's bull elk they eventually get. <clears throat> to top it off, the camping site the following year is paid for by the other two, and the winner gets to camp for free. It is a fun wager, or game actually, and it makes for some great times with them. That year, a few years back, we would it would be no different. I'd take my new rifle and do my best to make it a, a three-peat, as I'd won the last two years in a row. I'm not showboating by any means. It was simply a blessing to be in the right place at the right time, twice in a row. Rudy and Bill were, of course, seeking revenge. <laughs> With some new hunting tactics and strategies under their belts, and at least what, uh, at least that is what they claimed, we'd head out to our favorite place in the Cascade Mountain Range that hugs the Oregon coastline. This year, and seeing they were going to pay for it, both wanted an extra day to hunt, just in case. That was fine by me. All I was paying for was, was some of the food, after all. It was settled. We'd set up camp on Thursday morning, and with all the wives' permissions, we'd come home Sunday evening and skip church that day. However, we would not skip some sharing of what the, the Lord was doing in our lives while out in the woods hunting. Soon, Thursday came, and before we knew it, we were setting up camp of trees and howls. We used tree stands, each of us. Uh, once camp was set up and we packed a, a bit of lunch to take with us, we got to our usual tree stands. We built ourselves and left them there year-round. Of course, Bill had to replace a bit of his, as it looked like a bear had gotten to it. We always brought the tools and things we needed just in case things like that happened. So together, we helped Bill get his back up. I was on the east side facing southeast. Bill was dead center facing south. <clears throat> and Rudy, of course, was west of us facing southwest. It seemed. We were spaced out pretty far apart. But because of the landscape around us, we could see each other for the most part. Unless, of course, that coastal fog set in. That afternoon and into the early evening it was clear, hardly a cloud in the sky. But it was bitterly cold, that was for sure. All of us were well dressed for it. Uh, however, uh, and Rudy, well, he was so bundled up, and with a blanket, blanket tossed over his legs he'd brought, we thought he would never be able to get a shot off. He would, though. That first evening, things began to get a bit weird, though. We all heard it right before dusk, about 20 or so minutes before we called it a night and headed back to camp. It was a long, deep howl that sounded more like something out of one of those creepy movies than an actual coyote or any other animal we knew of. We all heard it, and I could see Bill turn and wave at me, putting his hands to his ear, only to quickly throw up both arms to give that uh, international gesture of, I don't know what that is and turned to Rudy to repeat it. I had no clue either. What made it really different was the length of the howl. It was long, really long, like 20 or so seconds long. I would say it was, or it seemed to be coming from pretty far off, but they were all long and deep, unfamiliar howls. I looked at Bill and gave him the twirling hand gesture, the finger in air, to say it was time to wrap it up and head back to camp, and so we did. And, of course, the talk during dinner was focused on the howl. Now, here's the deal. Rudy was from Washington State originally. For a long time growing up, uh, like all of us, he he heard about the legend and stories of Bigfoot. But he'd heard most stories himself, you know, more stories himself compared to us, at least. And, in fact, had a weird experience uh, he uh, had up to that point never shared with us until that night and it went like this a message to you Rudy Rudy was about 17 years old when his grandfather took him hunting they raised him his grandfather and his grand and his grandmother did as he as his dad was killed in Vietnam 
just after he was born, and his mother was in a car accident when he was ten. Death seemed to follow him for a long time. Eventually, by the time he was 28 years old, both grandparents were gone and he was alone. But that first day of hunting with his granddad ended up rather eventful, he'd go on to say. They were hunting, and I will give you the short of it, but they were hunting somewhere southeast of Mount Adams in Washington State. It was deer season, he said, and they were hiking up a small trail that led beside a pretty decent-sized creek that was, at the time, overflowing a bit. Suddenly, rocks and tree limbs came flying at them from in front of them and in back of them, it seemed. The screaming was so ear-piercing that happened, they literally had to put their hands over their ears. It was so horrible. In fact, he said his grandfather fell to his knees, ducking rocks and limbs, all the while trying to grab his rifle that landed on the ground. The screaming seemed to leave his, his grandfather dad dazed and confused and Rudy emphasized the the being dazed part Rudy then said he grabbed his grandfather and picked him up and started hurrying off back down the trail and back to camp the limbs debris and even the rocks kept flying at them at them from within the tree line what was worse was the screams here and there they continued as well I listened to Rudy with a bunch of skepticism to be honest But he was never one to tell fishing tales, that was for sure. But he said they'd gotten about a hundred yards or so back down the trail when he saw a large shadow of a thing running almost parallel to them inside the thick of the trees. He could not make it out completely, but he said it seemed to be on two legs. But he was never 100% sure to this day. He wrapped up his story with the two of them packing up and leaving, and fast night howls and visitors the first night was pretty quiet minus the thought that an elk or some deer were passing through or nearby our campsite there were the normal sounds of nighttime uh, of nighttime in the pacific northwest owls crickets and animal movements animals movements in the night at one point however bill and i both thought we heard that same howl again far off in the distance we chatted for a few more in the darkness before heading back to bed I think they both slept like babies for the rest of the night. As for me, however, something ominous seemed to be in the air all of a sudden, a feeling of it at least, and it started with that howl. The next day, hunting was great. However, I was not the winner. Rudy was. He bagged the first one, and a pretty big one with a nice rack to hang on that living room wall if his wife would go for it, of course. Either way, it was a great hunt that day for Rudy. Me and Bill continued on hunting until the evening. By the time we got back to camp later that night, dusk was upon us, and Rudy was still working on the elk he'd got, getting it butchered and all. We all helped field dress it earlier, out in the woods, and I think that was a massive mistake. But by the time Bill and I had dinner done, and yes, we got to try some elk, Rudy was done, and we were all huddled around the fire eating when we heard the howling again, but this time it was closer to camp, much closer. The second that howling started, we all looked at each other and almost dropped, I almost dropped my plate. It was that loud and shocking to be exact. For some reason, I just felt in my bones that it was not a wolf or a coyote. It had a different tone to it, something like a a loud ape moaning or, or something. Rudy's story of his grandfather and him had me suddenly thinking that there might be something else out there. It must have been written on my face just thinking about it because Bill nudged me and asked if I was okay. You okay, buddy? I admitted I was perplexed about the howl, and as I stated this fact, another came from even closer to our camp and louder than before. Suddenly, Rudy and Bill, too, were carrying expressions of, What the heck was that? A look on their faces. But just like that, it ended. Normal night sounds returned, and whatever it was either stopped or moved on or both. Eerie, that was for sure, and we felt it. That ominous feeling I had the night before was now shared. And the next day we discovered something. Well, let's say it was, it would leave us pondering what is really out there in the woods. My pile of... The guts were gone. The whole pile of innards of that elk were gone. 
Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible to have that many guts and some other parts be gone in a hurry, left alone in the Pacific North Woods. But that much? That fast? Well, it would have to be a large, largest pack of something to eat it all in one evening. It just seemed crazy to think something could. Bill and I just stood there for a few, looking at what was there now, dirt and some weeds smeared with blood. After cleaning up the breakfast mess to let us continue hunting, Ro Rudy showed up with, his same, with the same quizzical look on his face a few minutes later. We looked around a bit and found no footprints of any kind other than deer and some more elk tracks, but no dog or bear or anything else that was big enough or wandered around in a pack large enough to eat all that at once. I knew something was up, something not to my liking either. I suddenly felt even more uncomfortable being out there. But I was not going to stop hunting. I had a high-powered rifle, after all. I knew exactly how to use it, and I had friends around. So whatever feeling I had, I pushed aside to finish hunting. I should have listened to my gut. I stared it down. The hunt was on, still, and after the confusion and weirdness, we settled into getting those tags filled. The morning went by rather slowly, but eventually I saw an elk moving slowly uh, from the southwest. I barely caught it at first, and, but I noticed it now, and it was suddenly moving rather fast as if spooked by something, I guess you'd say. <clears throat> Either way, spooked or not, it came into the clearing on Bill's side. He noticed it almost galloping into the open area all of a sudden, and then, bang, Bill took it down. It was another enormous coastal bull elk. It was a beauty, to be honest, and I was getting a bit jealous, but just a bit. An elk that had to be nearly 800 pounds for sure. So, again, we field-dressed it, and the gunshot brought Rudy in, and he helped us as well. And they both took it back on the four-wheelers uh, trailer once that we're done with that. That left me alone in the woods, and guess what? Yeah. I had to move location as those guts were going to ruin my position. So I hiked it out for about three to 400 yards from the position to one we'd hunted about three years before. This stood on the edge of a much larger clearing, and that clearing was full of tall grass, taller shrubs, small fruit-bearing trees, some of them. A small brook wound through it like a slow-moving stake, too. Me, I held, uh, helped <clears throat> held myself up near a rock and a tree just inside the tree line. And that was when it all started. The scariest moment of my life would unfold. The howling was back, and it was louder than before and not far from my current position. I guessed a, a hundred yards or less, and the howl seemed at least, it did at the moment, like a warning telling me that I was in danger, life-threatening danger to be sure. I grabbed my backpack, threw it over my shoulders, and decided to and as quickly as possible, walk back to camp, avoiding the whole time the direction from which the howls were still coming. I did not get 50 yards when suddenly there was a growling, and I mean a growling that had me stopped immediately, and a cold shiver of fear run down my spine that I've, I've never felt before or since. I had no idea of the direction it came from until a moment later. From not even 20 yards ahead of me, in the thick of the forest that surrounded me, out of the dark, a dark, black, hairy beast of a thing from behind a large Douglas fir popped out. It was huge. The hair was as black as night and had to be eight to nine feet tall, give or take a few inches. It was simply amazing and frightening all at the same time. It screamed, Wah! and I mean a sound from the pit of Hades itself spewed out of this thing that literally had me yelling myself, Whoa! Suddenly, and before I could even reach for my rifle off my pack, that thing ran forward on basically all fours, stopped about 15 yards in front of me, and started screaming again. I started praying hard. Oh, God. Literally, I started praying loudly, asking the good Lord above to help me, and as I did, that thing stopped screaming and looked right into my eyes. We stood there, looking right at each other. The face was seriously like an ape, but a bit, well, mangled looking. I can't really explain it, but it looked as though its face was droopy, I guess you'd call it, and the mouth was, 
like a small slit until it screamed and a set of large block teeth were seen with what I I thought was a set of canines in the back. Yeah, I was that close. The whole body was covered in, in that black hair except for parts of its face which were wrinkled, droopy looking like I said and sort of dark gray in color. Its arms were long and it was hunched enough to where its knuckles seemed to touch the forest floor. It was a massive, barrel-chested and mean-looking thing. We stood there, the two of us, me praying as it gave me the most aggressive and angry glare I'd ever seen and have not since with his dark black and beady eyes. I was shaking. I wanted to reach for my rifle, but something in me said to be still. Don't move a muscle. Or, well, this thing, this Bigfoot, was going to tear right through you. Me and this monster, poof, we were in a stare down. Suddenly, it looked away first, but for good reason. We both heard it. The yelling of Bill and Rudy calling out my name and crashing through the woods towards us. And while I could not see them, I knew I would be okay. I just had a sense of calm hit me. I knew this was over. And it was. The thing, this Bigfoot looked back at me, waved its large arm and hand at me, grunted and tore off fast and back deeper into the woods. I sank to my knees started thanking the good Lord above just as my friends who would always be there for me arrived. I still hunt. I'm not afraid of death. Death is simply being brought home. But I am, like many a believer, still afraid of how I might die and leaving friends and loved ones behind, of course. That was my real fear that day. Fear of being mauled by a Bigfoot and having my two best friends find me a bloody mess and my family missing a husband and father. Ever wonder how you made it out of a situation alive you knew had to be a miracle? Well, that is what happened to me that day. But I'm still here, and guess what? When we can, we still hunt this area, me, Bill, and yes, Rudy too. Carl.